Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Introduction. In the United States, where we have more land than people, it is not at all difficult for persons in good health to make money. In this comparatively new field, there are so many avenues of success open, so many vocations which are not crowded, that any person of either sex who is willing, at least for the time being, to engage in any respectable occupation that offers may find lucrative employment. Those who really desire to attain an independence have only to set their minds upon it and adopt the proper means as they do in regard to any other object which they wish to accomplish, and the thing is easily done. But, however easy it may be found to make money, I have no doubt Many of my hearers will agree it is the most difficult thing in the world to keep it. The road to wealth is, as Dr. Franklin truly says, as plain as the road to the mill. It consists simply in expending less than we earn. That seems to be a very simple problem. Mr. Micaber, one of those happy creations of the genial Dickens, puts the case in a strong light when he says that to have annual income of 20 pounds per annum and spend twenty pounds and sixpence, is to be the most miserable of men, whereas to have an income of only twenty pounds, and spend but nineteen pounds and sixpence, is to be the happiest of mortals. Many of my readers may say, we understand this, this is economy, and we know economy is wealth, we know we can't eat our cake and keep it also. Yet I beg to say that perhaps more cases of failure arise from mistakes on this point than almost any other. The fact is, many people think they understand economy when they really do not. True economy is misapprehended, and people go through life without properly comprehending what that principle is. One says, I have an income of so much, and here is my neighbor who has the same, yet every year he gets something ahead and I fall short. Why is it? I know all about economy. He thinks he does, but he does not. There are men who think that economy consists in saving cheese parings and candle ends and cutting off two pence from the laundress bill and doing all sorts of little, mean, dirty things. Economy is not meanness. The misfortune is also that the class of persons let their economy apply in only one direction. They fancy they are so wonderfully economical and saving a halfpenny, where they ought to send two pence that they think they can afford to squander in other directions. A few years ago, before kerosene oil was discovered or thought of, one might stop overnight at almost any farmer's house in the agricultural districts and get a very good supper, but after supper he might attempt to read in the sitting room and would find it impossible with the inefficient light of one candle. The hostess, seeing his dilemma, would say, it is rather difficult to read here in evenings. The proverb says you must have a ship at sea in order to be able to burn two candles at once. We never have an extra candle except on extra occasions. These extra occasions occur perhaps twice a year. In this way, the good woman saves five, six, or ten dollars in that time. But the information which might be derived from having the extra light would, of course, far outweigh a ton of candles. But the trouble does not end here. Feeling that she is so economical in tallow candies, she thinks she can afford to go frequently to the village and spend twenty or thirty dollars for ribbons and furbelows, many of which are not necessary. This false connote may frequently be seen in men of business, and in those instances it often runs to writing paper. You find good businessmen who save all the old envelopes and scraps, and would not tear a new sheet of paper if they could avoid it for the world. This is all very well. They may in this way save five or ten dollars a year, but being so economical, only in note paper, they think they can afford to waste time, to have expensive parties, and to drive their carriages. This is an illustration of Dr. Franklin's saving at the spigot and wasting at the bunghole, penny-wise and pound-foolish. Punch in speaking of this, one idea, class of people, says they are like the man who bought a penny hearing for his family's dinner and then hired a coach and four to take it home. 
I never knew a man to succeed by practicing this kind of economy. True economy consists in always making the income exceed the outgo. Wear the old clothes a little longer if necessary. Dispense with the new pair of gloves. Mend the old dress. Live on plainer food if need be, so that, under all circumstances, unless some unforeseen accident occurs, there will be a margin in favor of the income. A penny here and a dollar there, placed at interest, goes on accumulating, and in this way the desired result is attained. It requires some training, perhaps, to accomplish this economy. But when once used to it, you will find there is more satisfaction in rational saving than in irrational spending. Here is a recipe which I recommend. I have found it to work an excellent cure for extravagance and especially for mistaken economy. When you find that you have no surplus at the end of the year and yet have a good income, I advise you to take a few sheets of paper and form them into a book and mark down every item of expenditure. Post it every day or week in two columns, one headed necessaries or even comforts and the other headed luxuries. And you will find that the latter column will be double treble and frequently ten times greater than the former. The real comforts of life cost but a small portion of what most of us can earn. Dr. Franklin says, It is the eyes of others and not our own eyes which ruin us. If all the world were blind except myself, I should not care for fine clothes or furniture. It is the fear of what Mrs. Grande may say that keeps the noses of many worthy families to the grindstone. In America, many persons like to repeat, We are all free and equal. But it is a great mistake in more senses than one. That we are born free and equal is a glorious truth in one sense. Yet we are not all born equally rich, and we never shall be. One may say, there is a man who has an income of $50,000 per annum. Well, I have but $1,000. I knew that fellow when he was poor like myself. Now he is rich and thinks he is better than I am. I will show him that I am as good as he is. I will go and buy a horse and buggy. No, I cannot do that. But I will go and hire one and ride this afternoon on the same road that he does, and thus prove to him that I am as good as he is. My friend, you need not take that trouble. You can easily prove that you are as good as he is. You have only to behave as well as he does, but you cannot make anybody believe that you are as rich as he is. Besides, if you put on these airs, add waste your time and spend your money, your poor wife will be obliged to scrub her fingers off at home and buy her tea, two ounces at a time, and everything else in proportion, in order that you may keep up appearances and, after all, deceive nobody. On the other hand, Mrs. Smith may say that her next-door neighbor married Johnson for his money, and everybody says so. She has a nice $1,000 camel's hair shawl, and she will make Smith get her an imitation one, and she will sit in the pew right next to her neighbor in church in order to prove that she is her equal. My good woman, you will not get ahead in the world if your vanity and envy thus take the lead. In this country, where we believe the majority ought to rule, we ignore that principle in regard to fashion and let a handful of people calling themselves the aristocracy run up a false standard of perfection, and endeavoring to rise to that standard, we constantly keep ourselves poor, all the time digging away for the sake of outside appearances. How much wiser to be a law unto ourselves and say, we will regulate our outgo by our income and lay up something for a rainy day. People ought to be as sensible on the subject of money-getting, as on any other subject, like causes produces like effects. You cannot accumulate a fortune by taking the road that leads to poverty. It needs no profit to tell us that those who live fully up to their means, without any thought of a reverse in this life, can never attain a pecuniary independence. Men and women accustomed to gratify every whim and caprice will find it hard, at first, to cut down their various unnecessary expenses and will feel it a great self-denial to live in a smaller house than they have been accustomed to, with less expensive furniture, less company, 
less costly clothing, fewer servants, a less number of balls, parties, theater goings, carriage ridings, pleasure excursions, cigar smokings, liquor drinkings, and other extravagances. But, after all, if they will try the plan of laying by a nest egg, or in other words, a small sum of money, at interest or judiciously invested in land, they will be surprised at the pleasure to be derived from constantly adding to their little pile, as well as from all the economical habits which are engendered by this course. The old suit of clothes and the old bonnet and dress will answer for another season. Their croton or spring water tastes better than champagne. A cold bath and a brisk walk will prove more exhilarating than a ride in the finest coach. A social chat, an evening's reading in the family circle, or an hour's play of hunt the slipper and blind man's buff will be far more pleasant than a fifty or five hundred dollar party when the reflection on the difference in cost is indulged in by those who begin to know the pleasures of saving. Thousands of men are kept poor, and tens of thousands are made so after they have acquired quite sufficient to support them well through life. In consequence of laying their plans of living on too broad a platform, some families expend twenty thousand dollars. Some families expend twenty thousand dollars per annum and some much more, and would scarcely know how to live on less, while others secure more solid enjoyment frequently on a twentieth part of that amount. Prosperity is a more severe ordeal than adversity, especially sudden prosperity. Easy come, easy go is an old and true proverb. A spirit of pride and vanity, when permitted to have full sway, is the undying canker-worm which gnaws the very vitals of a man's worldly possessions. Let them be small or great, hundreds or millions. Many persons, as they begin to prosper, immediately expand their ideas and commence expending for luxuries, until in a short time their expenses swallow up their income, and they become ruined in their ridiculous attempts to keep up appearances and make a sensation. I know a gentleman of fortune who says that when he first began to prosper, his wife would have a new and elegant sofa. That sofa, he says, cost me $30,000. When the sofa reached the house, it was found necessary to get chairs to match, then sideboards, carpets, and tables to correspond with them, and so on through the entire stock of furniture when at last it was found that the house itself was quite too small and old-fashioned for the furniture, and a new one was built to correspond with the new purchases. Thus, added my friend, summing up an outlay of $30,000 caused by that single sofa and saddling on me in the shape of servants, equipage, and the necessary expenses attendant upon keeping up a fine establishment, a yearly outlay of $11,000, and a target pinch at that, whereas ten years ago we lived with much more real comfort because with much less care on as many hundreds. The truth is, he continued, that sofa would have brought me to inevitable bankruptcy had not a most unexampled title to prosperity kept me above it, and had I not checked the natural desire to cut a dash. The foundation of success in life is good health. That is a substratum fortune. It is also the basis of happiness. A person cannot accumulate a fortune very well when he is sick. He has no ambition, no incentive, no force. Of course, there are those who have bad health and cannot help it. You cannot expect that such persons can accumulate wealth, but there are a great many in poor health who need not be so. If then sound health is the foundation of success and happiness in life, how important is it that we should study the laws of health which is but another expression for the laws of nature. The nearer we keep to the laws of nature, the nearer we are to good health. And yet how many persons there are who pay no attention to natural laws, but absolutely transgress them, even against their own natural inclination. We ought to know that the sin of ignorance is never winked at in regard to the violation of nature's laws. Their infraction always brings the penalty. A child may thrust its finger into the flames without knowing it will burn, and so suffers repentance, even will not stop the smart. Many of our ancestors knew very little about the principle of ventilation. They did not know much about oxygen, whatever, other, gin, 
they might have been acquainted with, and consequently they built their houses with little seven-by-nine feet bedrooms, and these good old pious Puritans would lock themselves up in one of these cells, say their prayers, and go to bed. In the morning they would devoutly return thanks for the preservation of their lives. During the night, and nobody had better reason to be thankful, probably some big crack in the window or in the door let in a little fresh air and thus save them. Many persons knowingly violate the laws of nature against their better impulses for the sake of fashion. For instance, there's one thing that nothing living except a vile worm ever naturally loved, and that is tobacco. Yet how many persons there are who deliberately train in a natural appetite and overcome this implanted aversion for tobacco to such a degree that they get to love it? They have got hold of a poisonous, filthy weed, or rather that takes a firm hold of them. Here are married men who run about spitting tobacco juice on the carpet and floors, and sometimes even upon their wives' bedsides. They do not kick their wives out of doors like drunken men, but their wives, I have no doubt, often wish they were outside of the house. Another perilous feature is that this artificial appetite, like jealousy, grows by what it feeds on. When you love that which is unnatural, a stronger appetite is created for the hurtful thing than the natural desire for what is harmless. There is an old proverb which says that habit is second nature, but an artificial habit is stronger than nature. Take, for instance, an old tobacco chewer. His love for the quid is stronger than his love for any particular kind of food. He can give up roast beef easier than give up the weed. Young lads regret that they are not men. They would like to go to bed boys and wake up men. And to accomplish this, they copy the bad habits of their seniors. Little Tommy and Johnny see their fathers or uncles smoke a pipe, and they say, If I could only do that, I would be a man too. Uncle John has gone out and left his pipe of tobacco. Let us try it. They take a match and light it, and then puff away. We will learn to smoke. Do you like it, Johnny? That lad dolefully replies, Not very much. It tastes bitter. By and by he grows pale, but he persists, and he soon offers up a sacrifice on the altar of fashion. But the boys stick to it and persevere, until at last they conquer their natural appetites and become the victims of acquired tastes. I speak by the book, for I've noticed its effects on myself, having gone so far as to smoke ten or fifteen cigars a day, although I have not used the weed during the last fourteen years, and never shall again. The more a man smokes, the more he craves smoking. The last cigar smoke simply excites the desire for another, and so on, incessantly. Take the tobacco chewer. In the morning, when he gets up, he puts a quid in his mouth and keeps it there all day, never taking it out except to exchange it for a fresh one, or when he is going to eat. Oh, yes, at intervals during the day and evening. Many a chewer takes out the quid and holds it in his hand long enough to take a drink and then pop it goes back again. This simply proves that the appetite for rum is even stronger than that for tobacco. When the tobacco chewer goes to your country seat and you show him your grapery and fruit house and the beauties of your garden, when you offer him some fresh ripe fruit and say, My friend, I have got here the most delicious apples and pears and peaches and apricots. I have imported them from Spain, France, and Italy. Just see those luscious grapes. There is nothing more delicious nor more healthy than ripe fruit, so help yourself. I want to see you delight yourself with these things. He will roll the dear quid under his tongue and answer, No, I thank you. I have got tobacco in my mouth. His palate has become narcotized by the noxious weed, and he has lost in a great measure, the delicate and inviolable taste for fruits. This shows what expensive, useless, and injurious habits men will get into. I speak from experience. I have smoked until I trembled like an aspen leaf. The blood rushed to my head, and I had a palpitation of the heart, which I thought was heart disease, till I was almost killed with fright. When I consulted my physician, he said, Break off tobacco using... I was not only injuring my health and spending a great deal of money, but I was setting a bad example. I obeyed his counsel. No young man in the world ever looked so beautiful as he thought he did behind a 15-cent cigar or a meerschaum. 
These remarks apply with tenfold force to the use of intoxicating drinks. To make money requires a clear brain. A man has got to see that two and two make four. He must lay all his plans with reflection and forethought and closely examine all the details and the ins and outs of business. As no man can succeed in business unless he has a brain to enable him to lay his plans and reason to guide him in their execution, so, no matter how bountifully a man may be blessed with intelligence, if the brain is muddled and his judgment warped by intoxicating drinks, it is impossible for him to carry on business successfully. How many good opportunities have passed, never to return, while a man was sipping a social glass with his friend? How many foolish bargains have been made under the influence of the nirvine, which temporarily makes its victim think he is rich? How many important chances have been put off until tomorrow, and then forever, because the wine cup has thrown the system into a state of lassitude, neutralizing the energy so essential to success in business? Verily, wine is a mocker. The use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage is as much an infatuation as is the smoking of opium by the Chinese, and the former is quite as destructive to the success of the businessman as the latter. It is an unmitigated evil, utterly indefensible in the light of philosophy, religion, or good sense. It is the parent of nearly every other evil in our country. The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum Chapter 1. Don't Mistake Your Vocation The safest plan, and the one most sure of success for the young man starting in life, is to select the vocation which is most congenial to his tastes. Parents and guardians are often quite too negligent in regard to this. It's very common for a father to say, for example, I have five boys. I will make Billy a clergyman, John a lawyer, Tom a doctor, and Dick a farmer. He then goes into town and looks about to see what he will do with Sammy. He returns home and says, Sammy, I see watchmaking is a nice genteel business. I think I will make you a goldsmith. He does this, regardless of Sam's natural inclinations or genius. We are all, no doubt, born for a wise purpose. There is as much diversity in our brains as in our countenances. Some are born natural mechanics, while some have great aversion to machinery. Let a dozen boys of ten years get together, and you will soon observe two or three are whittling out some ingenious device, working with locks or complicated machinery. When they were but five years old, their father could find no toy to please them like a puzzle. They are natural mechanics, but the other eight or nine boys have different aptitudes. I belong to the latter class. I never had the slightest love for mechanism. On the contrary, I have a sort of abhorrence for complicated machinery. I never had ingenuity enough to whittle a cider tap so it would not leak. I never could make a pen that I could write with or understand the principle of a steam engine. If a man was to take such a boy as I was, and attempt to make a watchmaker of him, the boy might, after an apprenticeship of five or seven years, be able to take apart and put together a watch. But all through life he would be working uphill and seizing every excuse for leaving his work and idling away his time. Watchmaking is repulsive to him. Unless a man enters upon the vocation intended for him by nature and best suited to his peculiar genius... He cannot succeed. I am glad to believe that the majority of persons do find their right vocation, yet we see many who have mistaken their calling, from the blacksmith up or down to the clergyman. You will see, for instance, that extraordinary linguist, the learned blacksmith, who ought to have been a teacher of languages, and you may have seen lawyers, doctors, and clergymen who were better fitted by nature for the anvil or the lapstone. End of Chapter 1 Rec The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 2 Select the Right Location After securing the right vocation, 
you must be careful to select the proper location. You may have been cut out for a hotel keeper, and they say it requires a genius to know how to keep a hotel. You might conduct a hotel like clockwork and provide satisfactorily for 500 guests every day. Yet, if you should locate your house in a small village where there is no railroad communication or public travel, the location would be your ruin. It is equally important that you do not commence business where there are already enough to meet all demands in the same occupation. I remember a case which illustrates this subject. When I was in London in 1858, I was passing down Holborn with an English friend and came to the Penny Shows. They had immense cartoons outside portraying the wonderful curiosities to be seen, all for a penny. Being a little in the show line myself, I said, let us go in here. We soon found ourselves in the presence of the illustrious showman, and he proved to be the sharpest man in that line I had ever met. He told us some extraordinary stories in reference to his bearded ladies, his albinos, and his armadillos, which we could hardly believe, but thought it better to believe it than look after the proof. He finally begged to call our attention to some wax statuary and showed us a lot of the dirtiest and filthiest wax figures imaginable. They looked as if they had not seen water since the deluge. What is there so wonderful about your statuary? I asked. I beg you not to speak so satirically, he replied. Sir, these are not Madame Tussaud's wax figures, all covered with glit and tinsel and imitation diamonds and copied from engravings and photographs. Mine, sir, were taken from life. Whenever you look upon one of those figures you may consider that you are looking upon the living individual. Glancing casually at them, I saw one labeled Henry VIII, and feeling a little curious upon seeing that it looked like Calvin Edson, the living skeleton, I said, Do you call that Henry the Eighth? He replied, Certainly, sir. It was taken from life at Hampton Court by special order of His Majesty on such a day. He would have given the hour of the day if I had resisted. I said, Everybody knows that Henry VIII was a great stout old king, and that figure is lean and lank. What do you say to that? Why, he replied, you would be lean and lank yourself if you sat there as long as he has. There was no resisting such arguments, I said to my English friend. Let us go out. Do not tell him who I am. I show the white feather. He beats me. He followed us to the door, and seeing the rabble in the street, he called out, Ladies and gentlemen, I beg to draw your attention to the respectable character of my visitors. Pointing to us as we walked away, I called upon him a couple of days afterwards, told him who I was, and said, My friend, you are an excellent showman but you have selected a bad location. He replied, This is true, sir. I feel that all my talents are thrown away, but what can I do? You can go to America, I replied. You can give full play to your faculties over there. You will find plenty of elbow room in America. I will engage you for two years. After that, you will be able to go on your own account. He accepted my offer and remained two years in my New York Museum. He then went to New Orleans and carried on a traveling show business during the summer. Today, he is worth $60,000 simply because he selected the right vocation and also secured the proper location. The old proverb says, Three removes are as bad as a fire, but when a man is in the fire, it matters but little how soon or how often he removes. End of chapter two. Record The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Chapter three. Avoid debt. Young men starting in life should avoid running into debt. There is scarcely anything that drags a person down like debt. 
It is a slavish position to get in, yet we find many a young man, hardly out of his teens, running in debt. He meets a chum and says, Look at this. I have got trusted for a new suit of clothes. He seems to look upon the clothes as so much given to him. Well, it frequently is so, but if he succeeds in pain and then gets trusted again, he is adopting a habit which will keep him in poverty through life. Debt robs a man of his self-respect and makes him almost despise himself. Grunting and groaning and working for what he has eaten up or worn out, and now when he is called upon to pay up, he has nothing to show for his money. This is properly termed working for a dead horse. I do not speak of merchants buying and selling on credit or of those who buy on credit in order to turn the purchase to a profit. The old Quaker said to his farmer's son, John, never get trusted, but if thee gets trusted for anything, let it be for manure, because that will help thee pay it back again. Mr. Beecher advised young men to get in debt if they could to a small amount in the purchase of land in the country districts. If a young man, he says, will only get in debt for some land and then get married, these two things will keep him straight, or nothing will. This may be safe to a limited extent, but getting in debt for what you eat and drink and wear is to be avoided. Some families have a foolish habit of getting credit at the stores and thus frequently purchase many things which might have been dispensed with. It is all very well to say, I have got trusted for 60 days, and if I don't have the money, the creditor will think nothing about it. There is no class of people in the world who have such good memories as creditors. When the 60 days run out, you will have to pay. If you do not pay, you will break your promise and probably resort to a falsehood. You may make some excuse or get in debt elsewhere to pay it, but that only involves you the deeper. A good-looking, lazy young fellow who was the apprentice boy, Horatio, his employer said, Horatio, did you ever see a snail? I think I have, he drawled out. You must have met him then, for I am sure you never overtook one, said the boss. Your creditor will meet you or overtake you and say, Now, my young friend, you agreed to pay me. You have not done it. You must give me your note. You give the note on interest and it commences working against you. It is a dead horse. The creditor goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning better off than when he retired to bed because his interest has increased during the night. But you grow poorer while you are sleeping, for the interest is accumulating against you. Money is in some respects like fire. It is a very excellent servant, but a terrible master. When you have it mastering you, when interest is constantly piling up against you, it will keep you down in the worst kind of slavery. But let money work for you, and you have the most devoted servant in the world. It is no I servant. There is nothing animate or inanimate that will work so faithfully as money when placed at interest well secured. It works night and day and in wet or dry weather. I was born in the blue law state of Connecticut, where the old Puritans had laws so rigid that it was said they fined a man for kissing his wife on Sunday. Yet these rich old Puritans would have thousands of dollars at interest and on Saturday night would be worth a certain amount. On Sunday, they would go to church and perform all the duties of a Christian. On waking up on Monday morning, they would find themselves considerably richer than the Saturday night previous, simply because their money placed at interest had worked faithfully for them all day Sunday, according to law. Do not let it work against you. If you do, there is no chance for success in life so far as money is concerned. John Randolph, the eccentric Virginian, once exclaimed in Congress, Mr. Speaker, I have discovered the Philosopher's Stone. Pay as you go. This is, indeed, nearer to the Philosopher's Stone than any alchemist has ever yet arrived. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Jill The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 4 
persevere. When a man is in the right path, he must persevere. I speak of this because there are some persons who are born tired, naturally lazy, and possessing no self-reliance and no perseverance. But they can cultivate these qualities, as Davy Crockett said. This thing, remember, when I am dead, be sure you are right, then go ahead. It is this go-aheadiveness, this determination, not to let the horrors or the blues take possession of you, so as to make you relax your energies in the struggle for independence, which you must cultivate. How many have almost reached the goal of their ambition, but, losing faith in themselves, have relaxed their energies, and the golden prize has been lost forever? It is, no doubt, often true, as Shakespeare says, there is a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the floods, leads on to fortune. If you hesitate, some bolder hand will stretch out before you and get the prize. Remember the proverb of Solomon, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Perseverance is sometimes but another word for self-reliance. Many persons naturally look on the dark side of life and borrow trouble. They are born so. Then they ask for advice, and they will be governed by one wind and blown by another, and cannot rely upon themselves. Until you can get so that you can rely upon yourself, you need not expect to succeed. I have known men, personally, who have met with pecuniary reverses, and absolutely committed suicide, because they thought they could never overcome their misfortune but I have known others who have met more serious financial difficulties and have bridged them over by simple perseverance, aided by a firm belief that they were doing justly and that providence would overcome evil with good. You will see this illustrated in any sphere of life. Take two generals. Both understand military tactics, both educated at West Point, if you please, both equally gifted, yet one having this principle of perseverance and the other lacking it. The former will succeed in his profession, while the latter will fail. One may hear the cry, The enemy are coming, and they have got cannon. Got cannon, says the hesitating general. Yes. Then halt every man. He wants time to reflect. His hesitation is his ruin. The enemy passes unmolested or overwhelms him while on the other hand, the general of pluck, perseverance, and self-reliance goes into battle with a will, and, amid the clash of arms, the booming of cannon, the shrieks of the wounded, and the moans of the dying, you will see this man persevering, going on, cutting and slashing his way, through, with unwavering determination, inspiring his soldiers to deeds of fortitude, valor, and triumph. End of chapter 4 Recording the Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Chapter 5. Whatever you do, do it with all your might. Work at it if necessary, early and late, in season and out of season, not leaving a stone unturned, and never deferring for a single hour that which can be done just as well now. The old proverb is full of truth and meaning. Whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. Many a man acquires a fortune by doing his business thoroughly, while his neighbor remains poor for life, because he only half does it. Ambition, energy, industry, perseverance are indispensable requisites for success in business. Fortune always favors the brave and never helps a man who does not help himself. It won't do to spend your time, like Mr. Micabor, in waiting for something to turn up. To such men, one of two things usually turns up, the poorhouse or the jail. For idleness breeds bad habits and clothes a man in rags. The poor spendthrift vagabond says to a rich man, I have discovered there is enough money in the world for all of us. If it was equally divided, 
this must be done, and we shall all be happy together. But, was the response, if everybody was like you, it would be spent in two months, and what would you do then? Oh, divide again, keep dividing, of course. I was recently reading in a London paper an account of a like philosophic pauper who was kicked out of a cheap boarding house because he could not pay his bill, but he had a roll of paper sticking out of his coat pocket, which upon examination proved to be his plan for paying off the national debt of England without the aid of a penny. People have got to do as Cromwell said, not only trust in Providence, but keep the powder dry. Do your part of the work, or you cannot succeed. Mahomet, one night while encamping in the desert, overheard one of his fatigued followers remark, I will lose my camel, and trust it to God. No, no, not so, said the prophet. Tie thy camel, and trust it to God. Do all you can for yourselves, and then trust to providence, or luck, or whatever you please to call it, for the rest. Depend upon your own personal exertions. The eye of the employer is often worth more than the hands of a dozen employees. In the nature of things, an agent cannot be so faithful to his employer as to himself. Many who are employers will call to mind instances where the best employee have overlooked important points, which could not have escaped their own observation as a proprietor. No man has a right to expect to succeed in life unless he understands his business, and nobody can understand his business thoroughly unless he learns it by personal application and experience. A man may be a manufacturer. He has got to learn the many details of his business personally. He will learn something every day, and he will find he will make mistakes nearly every day. And these very mistakes are helps to him in the way of experiences, if he but heeds them. He will be like the Yankee tin peddler who, having been cheated as to quality in the purchase of his merchandise, said, All right, there's a little information to be gained every day. I will never be cheated in that way again. Thus, a man buys his experience, and it is the best kind if not purchased at too dear a rate. I hold that every man should, like Cuvier, the French naturalist, thoroughly know his business. So proficient was he in the study of natural history that you might bring to him the bone or even a section of a bone of an animal which he had never seen described and, reasoning from analogy, he would be able to draw a picture of the object from which the bone had been taken. On one occasion his students attempted to deceive him. They rolled one of their number in a cow skin and put him under the professor's table as a new specimen. When the philosopher came into the room, some of the students asked him what animal it was. Suddenly the animal said, I am the devil, and I am going to eat you. It was but natural that Cuvier should desire to classify this creature, and examinately, intently, he said, Divided hoof, graminiferous, it cannot be done. He knew that an animal with a split hoof must live upon grass and grain or other kind of vegetation and would not be inclined to eat flesh, dead or alive, so he considered himself perfectly safe. The possession of a perfect knowledge of your business is an absolute necessity in order to ensure success. Among the maxims of the elder, Rothschild was one, all apparent paradox. Be cautious and bold. This seems to be a contradiction in terms, but it is not, and there is great wisdom in the maxim. It is, in fact, a condensed statement of what I have already said. It is to say, you must exercise your caution in laying your plans, but be bold in carrying them out. A man who is all caution will never dare to take hold and be successful, and a man who is all boldness is merely reckless and must eventually fail. A man may go on change and make fifty or one hundred thousand dollars in speculating in stocks at a single operation, but if he has simple boldness without caution, it is mere chance, and what he gains today he will lose tomorrow. You must have both the caution and the boldness to ensure success. 
the Rothschilds have another maxim. Never have anything to do with an unlucky man or place. That is to say, never have anything to do with a man or place which never succeeds, because although a man may appear to be honest and intelligent, yet if he tries this or that thing and always fails, it is on account of some fault or infirmity that you may not be able to discover, but nevertheless which must exist. There is no such thing in the world as luck. There never was a man who could go out in the morning and find a purse full of gold in the street today and another tomorrow, and so on, day after day. He may do so once in his life, but so far as mere luck is concerned, he is as liable to lose it as to find it. Like causes produce like effects. If a man adopts the proper methods to be successful, luck will not prevent him. If he does not succeed, there are reasons for it, although perhaps he may not be able to see them. End of chapter 5 The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum Chapter 6 Use the Best Tools Men and engaging employees should be careful to get the best. Understand, you cannot have two good tools to work with. And there is no tool you should be so particular about as living tools. If you get a good one, it is better to keep him than keep changing. He learns something every day, and you are benefited by the experience he acquires. He is worth more to you this year than last, and he is the last man to part with, provided his habits are good and he continues faithful. If, as he gets more valuable, he demands an exorbitant increase of salary on the supposition that you can't do without him, let him go. Whenever I have such an employee, I always discharge him first to convince him that his place may be supplied and second because he is good for nothing if he thinks he is invaluable and cannot be spared. But I would keep him, if possible, in order to profit from the result of his experience. An important element in an employee is the brain. You can see bills up. Hands wanted. But hands are not worth a great deal without heads. Mr. Beecher illustrates this in this wise. An employee offers his services by saying, I have a pair of hands and one of my fingers thinks. That is very good, says the employer. Another man comes along and says, he has two fingers that think. Ah, that is better. But a third calls in and says that all his fingers and thumbs think. That is better still. Finally, another steps in and says, I have a brain that thinks. I think all over. I am a thinking as well as a working man. You are the man I want, says the delighted employer. Those men who have brains and experience are therefore the most valuable and not to be readily parted with. It is better for them as well as yourself to keep them at reasonable advances in their salaries from time to time. End of Chapter 6 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 7 don't get above your business. Young men, after they get through their business training or apprenticeship, instead of pursuing their avocation and rising in their business, will often lie about doing nothing. They say, I have learned my business, but I am not going to be a hireling. What is the object of learning my trade or profession unless I establish myself? Have you capital to start with? No, but I'm going to have it. How are you going to get it? I will tell you confidentially. I have a wealthy old aunt, and she will die pretty soon. But if she does not, I expect to find some rich old man who will lend me a few thousands to give me a start. If I only get the money to start with, I will do well. There is no greater mistake than when a young man believes he will succeed with borrowed money. Why? 
because every man's experience coincides with that of Mr. Astor, who said, It was more difficult for him to accumulate his first thousand dollars than all the succeeding millions that made up his colossal fortune. Money is good for nothing unless you know the value of it by experience. Give a boy twenty thousand dollars and put him in business, and the chances are that he will lose every dollar of it before he is a year older, like buying a ticket in the lottery and drawing a prize. It is easy come, easy go. He does not know the value of it. Nothing is worth anything unless it costs effort. Without self-denial and economy, patience and perseverance, and commencing with capital which you have not earned, you are not sure to succeed in accumulating. Young men, instead of waiting for dead man's shoes, should be up and doing, for there is no class of persons who are so unaccommodating in regard to dying as these rich old people, and it is fortunate for the expectant heirs that it is so. Nine out of ten of the rich men of our country today started out in life as poor boys with determined wills, industry, perseverance, economy, and good habits. They went on gradually, made their own money, and saved it, and this is the best way to acquire a fortune. Stephen Gerard started life as a poor cabin boy and died worth nine million dollars. A.T. Stewart was a poor Irish boy, and he paid taxes on a million and a half dollars of income per year. John Jacob Astor was a poor farmer boy and died worth 20 millions. Cornelius Vanderbilt began life rowing a boat from Staten Island to New York. He presented our government with a steamship worth a million of dollars and died worth 50 million. There is no royal road to learning, says the proverb. I may say it is equally true. There is no royal road to wealth, but I think there is a royal road to both. The road to learning is a royal one, the road that enables the student to expand his intellect and add every day to his stock of knowledge, until in the pleasant process of intellectual growth he is able to solve the most profound problems, to count the stars, to analyze every atom of the globe, and to measure the firmament that is a regal highway, and it is the only road worth traveling. So, in regard to wealth... Go on in confidence, study the rules, and above all things, study human nature. For the proper study of mankind is man, and you will find that while expanding the intellect and the muscles, your enlarged experience will enable you every day to accumulate more and more principle, which will increase itself by interest and otherwise, until you arrive at a state of independence. You will find, as a general thing, that the poor boys get rich and the rich boys get poor. For instance, a rich man at his decease leaves a large estate to his family. His eldest sons, who have helped him earn his fortune, know by experience the value of money, and they take their inheritance and add to it. The separate portions of the young children are placed at interest, and the little fellows are patted on the head and told a dozen times a day, You are rich! You will never have to work. You can always have whatever you wish, for you were born with a golden spoon in your mouth. The young heir soon finds out what that means. He has the finest dresses and playthings. He is crammed with sugar candies and almost killed with kindness. And he passes from school to school, petted and flattered. He becomes arrogant and self-conceited, abuses his teachers, and carries everything with a high hand. He knows nothing of the real value of money, having never earned any, but he knows all about the golden spoon business. At college, he invites his poor fellow students to his room, where he wines and dines them. He is cajoled and caressed and called a glorious good fellow because he is so lavish of his money. He gives his game suppers, drives his fast horses, invites his chums to feats and parties determined to have lots of good times. He spends the night in frolics and debauchery and leads off his companions with the familiar song, We won't go home till morning. He gets them to join him in pulling down signs, taking gates from their hinges and throwing them into backyards and horse ponds. If the police arrest them, 
he knocks them down, is taken to the lockup, and joyfully foots the bills. Ah, my boys, he cries, what is the use of being rich if you can't enjoy yourself? He might more truly say, if you can't make a fool of yourself, but he is fast, hates slow things, and doesn't see it. Young men loaded down with other people's money are almost sure to lose all they inherit, and they acquire all sorts of bad habits, which, in the majority of cases, ruin them in health, purse, and character. In this country, one generation follows another, and the poor of today are rich in the next generation, or the third. Their experience leads them on, and they become rich, and they leave vast riches to their young children. These children, having been reared in luxury, are inexperienced and get poor, and after long experience, another generation comes on and gathers up riches again in turn. And thus, history repeats itself, and happy is he who, by listening to the experience of others, avoids the rocks and shoals on which so many have been wrecked. In England, the business makes the man. If a man in that country is a mechanic or working man, he is not recognized as a gentleman. On the occasion of my first appearance before Queen Victoria, the Duke of Wellington asked me what sphere in life General Tom Thumb's parents were in. His father is a carpenter, I replied. Oh, I had heard he was a gentleman, was the response of his grace. In this Republican country, the man makes the business. No matter whether he is a blacksmith, a shoemaker, a farmer, banker, or lawyer, so long as his business is legitimate, he may be a gentleman. So any legitimate business is a double blessing. It helps the man engaged in it and also helps others. The farmer supports his own family, but he also benefits the merchant or mechanic who needs the products of his farm. The tailor not only makes a living by his trade, but he also benefits the farmer, the clergyman, and others who cannot make their own clothing. But all these classes often may be gentlemen. The great ambition should be to excel all others engaged in the same occupation. The college student who was about graduating said to an old lawyer, I have not yet decided which profession I will follow. Is your profession full? The basement is much crowded, but there is plenty of room upstairs was the witty and truthful reply. No profession, trade, or calling is overcrowded in the upper story. Wherever you find the most honest and intelligent merchant or banker or the best lawyer, the best doctor, the best clergyman, the best shoemaker, carpenter, or anything else, that man is most sought for and has always enough to do. As a nation, Americans are too superficial. They are striving to get rich quickly they do not generally do their business as substantially and thoroughly as they should. But whoever excels all others in his own line, if his habits are good and his integrity undoubted, cannot fail to secure abundant patronage and the wealth that naturally follows. Let your motto then always be exclusier, for by living up to it there is no such word as fail. End of chapter 7 Recording by The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 8 Learn Something Useful Every man should make his son or daughter learn some useful trade or profession, so that in these days of changing fortunes of being rich today and poor tomorrow, they may have something tangible to fall back upon. This provision might save many persons from misery who by some expected turn of fortune have lost all their means. End of chapter 8 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 9 Let Hope Predominate But Be Not Too Visionary Many persons are always kept poor because they are too visionary. Every project looks to them like certain success, and therefore they keep changing from one business to another, always in hot water, always under the harrow. The plan of counting the chickens before they are hatched is an error of ancient date, but it does not seem to improve by age. 
End of Chapter 9 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 10 Do Not Scatter Your Powers Engage in one kind of business only and stick to it faithfully until you succeed or until your experience shows that you should abandon it. A constant hammering on one nail will generally drive it home at last so that it can be clinched. When a man's undivided attention is centered on one object, his mind will constantly be suggesting improvements of value, which would escape him if his brain was occupied by a dozen different subjects at once. Many a fortune has slipped through a man's fingers because he was engaged in too many occupations at a time. There is good sense in the old caution against having too many irons in the fire at once. End of chapter 10 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 11 Be Systematic Men should be systematic in their business. A person who does business by rule, having a time and place for everything, doing his work promptly, will accomplish twice as much and with half the trouble of him who does it carelessly and slipshod. By introducing system into all your transactions, doing one thing at a time, always meeting appointments with punctuality, you find leisure for pastime and recreation, whereas the man who only half does one thing and then turns to something else and half does that will have his business at loose ends and will never know when his day's work is done for it never will be done. Of course, there is a limit to all these rules. We must try to preserve the happy medium, for there is such a thing as being too systematic. There are men and women, for instance, who put away things so carefully that they can never find them again. It is too much like the red tape formality at Washington. And Mr. Dickens' circumlocation office, all theory and no result. When the Astor House was first started in New York City, it was undoubtedly the best hotel in the country. The proprietors had learned a great deal in Europe regarding hotels, and the landlords were proud of the rigid system which pervaded every department of their great establishment. When 12 o'clock at night had arrived and there were a number of guests around, one of the proprietors would say, Touch that bell, John, and in two minutes, 60 servants with a water bucket in each hand would present themselves in the hall. This, said the landlord, addressing his guests, is our fire bell. It will show you we are quite safe here. We do everything systematically. This was before the croton water was introduced into the city, but they sometimes carried their system too far. On one occasion, when the hotel was thronged with guests, one of the waiters was suddenly indisposed, and although there were fifty waiters in the hotel... The landlord thought he must have his full complement or his system would be interfered with. Just before dinner time, he rushed downstairs and said, There must be another waiter. I am one waiter short. What can I do? He happened to see Boots, the Irishman. Pat said, He, Wash your hands and face. Take that white apron and come into the dining room in five minutes. Now, Pat, you must stand behind these two chairs and wait on the gentleman who will occupy them. Did you ever act as a waiter? I know all about it, sure, but I never did it. Like the Irish pilot, on one occasion, when the captain, thinking he was considerably out of his course, asked, Are you certain you understand what you are doing? Pat replied, Sure, and I knows every rock in the channel. That moment... Bang! Thump the vessel against a rock. Ah! Be jabbers! And that is one of them, continued the pilot, but to return to the dining room. Pat said the landlord, Here we do everything systematically. You must first give the gentlemen each a plate of soup, and when they finish, then ask them what they will have next. Pat replied, Ah! Ah! Uh, I understand perfectly the virtues of schistame. Very soon in came the guests. The plates of soup were placed before them. One of Pat's two gentlemen ate his soup. The other did not care for it. He said, Waiter, take this plate away and bring me some fish. Pat looked at the untasted plate of soup and remembering the instructions of the landlord in regard to system, replied, 
not till you have ate your supper. Of course, that was carrying system entirely too far. End of chapter 11. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 12. Read the Newspapers. Always take a trustworthy newspaper and thus keep thoroughly posted in regard to the transactions of the world. He who is without a newspaper is cut off from his species. In these days of telegraphs and steam, many important inventions and improvements in every branch of trade are being made, and he who don't consult the newspapers will soon find himself and his business left out in the cold. End of chapter 12 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 13 Beware of Outside Operations we sometimes see men who have obtained fortune suddenly become poor. In many cases, this arises from intemperance and often from gaming and other bad habits. Frequently, it occurs because a man has been engaged in outside operations of some sort. When he gets rich in his legitimate business, he is told of a grand speculation where he can make a score of thousands. He is constantly flattered by his friends who tell him that he is born lucky that everything he touches turns into gold. Now, if he forgets that his economical habits, his restitute of conduct and a personal attention to a business, which he understood, caused his success in life, he will listen to the siren voices. He says, I will put in $20,000. I have been lucky, and my good luck will soon bring me back $60,000. A few days elapse, and it is discovered he must put in $10,000 more, Soon after, he is told, it is all right, but certain matters not foreseen require an advance of $20,000 more, which will bring him a rich harvest. But before the time comes around to realize, the bubble bursts. He loses all he is possessed of, and then he learns what he ought to have known at the first, that however successful a man may be in his own business, if he turns from that and engages ill a business, which he don't understand, he is like Samson, when shorn of his locks. His strength has departed, and he becomes like other men. If a man has plenty of money, he ought to invest something in everything that appears to promise success, and that will probably benefit mankind. But let the sums thus invested be moderate in amount, and never let a man foolishly jeopardize a fortune that he has earned in a legitimate way by investing it in things in which he has had no experience. End of chapter 13. Record the Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 14 Don't Endorse Without Security I hold that no man ought ever to endorse a note or become security for any man, be it his father or brother, to a greater extent than he can afford to lose and care nothing about without taking good security. Here is a man that is worth $20,000. He is doing a thriving manufacturing or mercantile trade. You are retired and living on your money. He comes to you and says, You are aware that I am worth $20,000 and don't owe a dollar. If I had $5,000 in cash, I could purchase a particular lot of goods and double my money in a couple of months. Will you endorse my note for that amount? You reflect that he is worth $20,000 and you incur no risk by endorsing his note. You like to accommodate him, and you lend your name without taking the precaution of getting security. Shortly after, he shows you the note with your endorsement, canceled, and tells you, probably truly, that he made the profit that he expected by the operation. You reflect that you have done a good action, and the thought makes you feel happy. By and by, the same thing occurs again, and you do it again. You have already fixed the impression in your mind that it is perfectly safe to endorse his notes without security. But the trouble is, this man is getting money too easily. He has only to take your note to the bank, get it discounted, and take the cash. He gets money for the time being without effort, without inconvenience to himself. Now mark the result. He sees a chance for speculation outside of his business. A temporary investment of only $10,000 is required. It is sure to come back before a note at the bank would be due. 
He places a note for that amount before you. You sign it almost mechanically, being firmly convinced that your friend is responsible and trustworthy. You endorse his notes as a matter of course. Unfortunately, the speculation does not come to a head quite as soon as was expected, and another $10,000 note must be discounted to take up the last one when due. Before this note matures, the speculation has proved an utter failure, and all the money is lost. Does the loser tell his friend, the endorser, that he has lost half of his fortune? Not at all. He don't even mention that he has speculated at all, but he has got excited. The spirit of speculation has seized him. He sees others making large sums in this way. We seldom hear of the losers. And, like other speculators, he looks for his money where he loses it. He tries again. Endorsing notes has become chronic with you, and at every loss he gets your signature for whatever amount he wants. Finally, you discover your friend has lost all of his property and all of yours. You are overwhelmed with astonishment and grief, and you say, It is a hard thing. My friend here has ruined me. But you should add, I have also ruined him. If you had said in the first place, I will accommodate you, but I never endorse without taking ample security, he could not have gone beyond the length of his tether, and he would never have been tempted away from his legitimate business. It is a very dangerous thing, therefore, at any time, to let people get possession of money too easily. It tempts them to hazardous speculations, if nothing more. Solomon truly said, He that hadeth seritaship is sure. So with the young man starting in business, let him understand the value of money by earning it. When he does understand its value, then grease the wheels a little in helping him to start business. But remember... Men who get money with too great facility cannot usually succeed. You must get the first dollars by hard knocks and at some sacrifice in order to appreciate the value of those dollars. End of chapter 14. Recording The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 15. Advertise Your Business. We all depend more or less upon the public for our support. We all trade with the public. Lawyers, doctors, shoemakers, artists, blacksmiths, showmen, opera stagers, railroad presidents, and college professors. Those who deal with the public must be careful that their goods are valuable, that they are genuine, and will give satisfaction. When you get an article which you know is going to please your customers, and that when they have tried it, they will feel they have got their money's worth, then let the fact be known that you have got it. Be careful to advertise it in some shape or other, because it is evident that if a man has ever so good an article for sale, and nobody knows it, it will bring him no return. In a country like this, where nearly everybody reads, and where newspapers are issued and circulated in editions of 5,000 to 200,000, it would be very unwise if this channel was not taken advantage of to reach the public in advertising. A newspaper goes into the family and is read by wife and children, as well as the head of the home. Hence, hundreds and thousands of people may read your advertisement while you are attending to your routine business. Many perhaps read it while you are asleep. The whole philosophy of life is first sow, then reap. That is the way the farmer does. He plants his potatoes and corn and sows his grain and then goes about something else, and the time comes when he reaps. But he never reaps first and sows afterwards. This principle applies to all kinds of business and to nothing more eminently than to advertising. If a man has a genuine article, there is no way in which he can reap more advantageously than by sowing to the public in this way. He must, of course, have a really good article, and one which will please his customers. Anything spurious will not succeed permanently, because the public is wiser than many imagine. Men and women are selfish, and we all prefer purchasing where we can get the most for our money, and we try to find out where we can most surely do so. You may advertise a spurious article and induce many people to call and buy at once, but they will denounce you as an imposter and swindler, and your business will gradually die out and leave you poor. This is right. Few people can safely depend upon chance custom. You all need to have your customers return and purchase again. A man said to me, I have tried advertising. It did not succeed. Yet I have a good article. I replied, my friend, there may be exceptions to a general rule, 
but how do you advertise? I put it in a weekly newspaper three times and paid a dollar and a half for it, I replied. Sir, advertising is like learning. A little is a dangerous thing. A French writer says that the reader of a newspaper does not see the first mention of an ordinary advertisement. The second insertion he sees, but does not read. The third insertion he reads. The fourth insertion he looks at the price. The fifth insertion he speaks of it to his wife. The sixth insertion, he is ready to purchase. And the seventh insertion, he purchases. Your object in advertising is to make the public understand what you have got to sell. And if you have not the pluck to keep advertising until you have imparted that information, all the money you have spent is lost. You are like the fellow who told the gentleman, if he would give him ten cents, it would save him a dollar. How can I help you so much with so small a sum? asked the gentleman in surprise. I started out this morning, hiccuped the fellow, with the full determination to get drunk, and I have spent my only dollar to accomplish the object, and it has not quite done it. Ten cents worth more of whiskey would just do it, and in this manner I should save the dollar already expended. So a man who advertises at all must keep it up until the public knows who and what he is and what his business is, or else the money invested in advertising is lost. Some men have a peculiar genius for writing a striking advertisement, one that will arrest the attention of the reader at first sight. This fact, of course, gives the advertiser a great advantage. Sometimes a man makes himself popular by a unique sign or a curious display in his window. Recently, I observed a swing sign extending over the sidewalk in front of a store on which was the inscription in plain letters. End of chapter 15. Record. The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Chapter 16. Don't Read the Other Side. Of course I did, and so did everybody else, and I learned that the man had made all independence by first attracting the public to his business in that way, and then using his customers well afterwards. Jenin, the Hatter, bought the first Jenny Lynn ticket at auction for $225 because he knew it would be a good advertisement for him. Who is the bidder? said the auctioner as he knocked down that ticket at Castle Garden. Jenin, the Hatter, was the response. Here were thousands of people from the Fifth Avenue and from distant cities and the highest stations in life. Who is Jenin, the Hatter? they exclaimed. They had never heard of him before. The next morning, the newspapers and telegraph had circulated the facts from Maine to Texas, and from five to ten millions of people had read that the tickets sold at auction for Jenny Lynn's first concert amounted to about $20,000, and that a single ticket was sold at $225 to Jenin the Hatter. Men throughout the country and voluntarily took off their hats to see if they had a Jenin hat on their heads. As a town in Iowa, it was found that in the crowd around the post office, there was one man who had a Jenin hat, and he showed it in triumph, although it was worn out and not worth two cents. Why, one man exclaimed, you have a real Jenin hat. What a lucky fellow you are. Another man said, hang on to that hat. It will be a valuable heirloom in your family. Still, another man in the crowd, who seemed to envy the possessor of this good fortune, said, Come, give us all a chance. Put it up at auction. He did so, and it was sold as a keepsake for $9.50. What was the consequence to Mr. Jannon? He sold 10,000 extra hats per annum the first six years. Nine-tenths of the purchasers bought of him, probably out of curiosity, and many of them, finding that he gave them an equivalent for their money, became his regular customers. This novel advertisement first struck their attention, and then, as he made a good article, they came again. Now, I don't say that everybody should advertise as Mr. Jenin did, but I say if a man has got goods for sale and he don't advertise them in some way, the chances are that some day the sheriff will do it for him. Nor do I say that everybody must advertise in a newspaper or indeed use printer's ink at all. On the contrary, although that article is indispensable in the majority of cases, yet doctors and clergymen, and sometimes lawyers and some others, can more effectually reach the public in some other manner. 
but it is obvious. They must be known in some way, else how could they be supported? End of chapter 16. Recording The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 17. Be Polite and Kind to Your Customers. Politeness and civility are the best capital ever invested in business. Large stores, gilt signs, flaming advertisements will all prove unavailing if you or your employees treat your patrons abruptly. The truth is, the more kind and liberal a man is, the more generous will be the patronage bestowed upon him. Like begets like. The man who gives the greatest amount of goods of a corresponding quality for the least sum, still reserving for himself a profit, will generally succeed best in the long run. This brings us to the golden rule. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them. And they will do better by you than if you always treated them, as if you wanted to get the most you could out of them for the least return. Men who drive sharp bargains with their customers, acting as if they never expected to see them again, will not be mistaken. They will never see them again as customers. People don't like to pay and get kicked also. One of the ushers in my museum once told me he intended to whip a man who was in the lecture room as soon as he came out. What for? I inquired. Because he said I was no gentleman, replied the usher. Never mind, I replied. He pays for that, and you will not convince him you are a gentleman by whipping him. I cannot afford to lose a customer. If you whip him, he will never visit the museum again and he will induce friends to go with him to other places of amusement instead of this, and thus you see, I should be a serious loser. But he insulted me, muttered the usher. Exactly, I replied. And if he owned the museum, and you had paid him for the privilege of visiting it, and he had then insulted you, there might be some reason in your resenting it. But in this instance, he is the man who pays while we receive and you must, therefore, put up with his bad manners. My usher laughingly remarked that this was undoubtedly the true policy, but he added that he should not object to an increase of salary if he was expected to be abused in order to promote my interest. End of chapter 17 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 18 Be Charitable of course men should be charitable, because it is a duty and a pleasure. But even as a matter of policy, if you possess no higher incentive, you will find that the liberal man will command patronage, while the sordid, uncharitable miser will be avoided. Solomon says, There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Of course, the only true charity is that which is from the heart. The best kind of charity is to help those who are willing to help themselves. Promiscuous almsgiving without inquiring into the worthiness of the applicant is bad in every sense. But to search out and quietly assist those who are struggling for themselves is the kind that scattereth and yet increaseth. But don't fall into the idea that some person's practice of giving a prayer instead of a potato and a benediction instead of bread to the hungry it is easier to make Christians with full stomachs than empty. End of chapter 18 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 19 Don't Blab Some men have a foolish habit of telling their business secrets. If they make money, they like to tell their neighbors how it was done. Nothing is gained by this, and oftentimes much is lost. Say nothing about your profits, your hopes, your expectations, your intentions. And this should apply to letters as well as to conversation. Goethe makes Mephistophiles say, Never write a letter, nor destroy one. Businessmen must write letters, but they should be careful what they put in them. If you are losing money, be especially cautious and not tell of it, or you will lose your reputation. End of chapter 19 The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum Chapter 20 Preserve Your Integrity it is more precious than diamonds or rubies. The old miser said to his sons, Get money. Get it honestly if you can, but get money. 
This advice was not only atrociously wicked, but it was the very essence of stupidity. It was much as to say, if you find it difficult to obtain money honestly, you can easily get it dishonestly. Get it in that way, poor fool. Not to know that the most difficult thing in life is to make money dishonestly. Not to know that our prisons are full of men who attempted to follow this advice. Not to understand that no man can be dishonest without soon being found out, and that when his lack of principle is discovered, nearly every avenue to success is closed against him forever. The public very properly shun all whose integrity is doubted. No matter how polite and pleasant and accommodating a man may be, none of us dare to deal with him if we suspect false weights and measures. Strict honesty not only lies at the foundation of all success in life, financially, but in every other respect. Uncompromising integrity of character is invaluable. It secures to its possessor a peace and joy which cannot be attained without it, which no amount of money or houses and lands can purchase. A man who is known to be strictly honest may be ever so poor, but he has the purses of all the community at his disposal. For all know that if he promises to return what he borrows, he will never disappoint them. As a mere matter of selfishness, therefore, if a man has no higher motive for being honest, all will find that the maxim of Dr. Franklin can never fail to be true, that honesty is the best policy. To get rich is not always equivalent to being successful. There are many rich, poor men. While there are many others, honest and devout men and women, who have never possessed so much money as some rich person squander in a week, but who are nevertheless really richer and happier than any man can ever be, while he is a transgressor of the higher laws of his being. The inordinate love of money, no doubt, may be, and is the root of all evil. But money itself, when properly used, is not only a handy thing to have in the house, but affords the gratification of blessing our race, by enabling its possessor to enlarge the scope of human happiness and human influence. The desire for wealth is nearly universal, and none can say it is not laudable, provided the possessor of it accepts its responsibilities and uses it as a friend to humanity. The history of money-getting, which is commerce, is a history of civilization, and wherever trade has flourished most, there too have art and science produced the noblest fruits. In fact, as a general thing, money-getters are the benefactors of our race. To them, in a great measure, are we indebted for our institutions of learning and of art, our academies, colleges, and churches. It is no argument against the desire for, or the possession of wealth, to say that there are sometimes misers who hoard money only for the sake of hoarding, and who have had no higher aspiration than to grasp everything which comes within their reach. As we have sometimes hypocrites in religion and demagogues in politics, so there are occasionally misers among money-getters. These, however, are only exceptions to the general rule. But when in this country we find such a nuisance and stumbling block as a miser, we remember with gratitude that in America we have no laws of primogeniture, and that in the due course of nature the time will come when the hoarded dust will be scattered for the benefit of mankind. To all men and women, therefore, do I conscientiously say, make money honestly and not otherwise. For Shakespeare has truly said, he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. End of chapter 20. Recording by Jill Preston. End of The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum.